Good morning, everyone. Uh, my topic this morning is the antithesis in the preaching of the gospel. And maybe we could have the first slide if we could. I remember from younger days that it used to be quite common for ministers to preach about the antithesis. They would warn us to maintain the antithesis, and the assumption was that we knew what they meant. My sense is that our preachers don't use the word as often anymore, and I found myself wondering why that is so. So this morning I'd like to take you along with me to revisit an old topic, and as you'll see on the slide there, I've divided my talk into three parts. First, what is the antithesis and where does this idea come from? Uh, second, is it a theme that can be traced through the Bible, and if so, how? And thirdly, what place should the antithesis have in the preaching of the gospel? So to begin with the first, um, basically, antithesis is a Greek word that means opposition or contrast. So it can be used as a general term for any number of oppositions. For example, during the Reformation, John Calvin in his Institutes uh, spoke about the antithesis that separates man as the image of God from the rest of God's creatures. But in the 19th century, the word antithesis took on a more specialized meaning in theological discourse. It came to refer to the opposition between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, between Christ and Satan. More specifically, sometimes between the regenerate and the unregenerate, even between the old and the new nature, between principles directed toward God and principles directed away from Him. And as such, people began to speak simply of the antithesis without further qualification. And this usage was largely due to the influence of Abraham Kuyper, well known as a Dutch Reformed theologian, leader of a political party known as the Anti-Revolutionary Party, editor of a daily and a weekly paper, the author of many books, the founder of the Free University of Amsterdam, and even for a time the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. As we'll see on the, on the slide here, uh, in 1898, Kuiper delivered his famous six lectures on Calvinism at Princeton University. In the first of these lectures, he characterized his time as a time of mortal combat between two life systems. On the one side was post-enlightenment modernism with its spirit of revolution, which posed a great danger for the Christian heritage of society. On the other side was Calvinism, the flower of the Reformation, the highest form of Christianity, said Kuiper, which had the potential to develop an alternative to modernism in every sphere. And then in the remaining five lectures, Kuiper set forth the contribution that Calvinism would make in the areas of religion, politics, science, art, and even the future of human thought and culture. Now, of these five areas, it's especially in the sphere of politics that Abraham Kuyper and his, and his followers developed the notion of the antithesis, positioning his anti-revolutionary party with its explicitly confessional basis over against the secular principles of the other parties. But our focus is going to be on the preaching of the gospel. So I'd like to have a look with you quickly at Abraham Kuyper's second lecture on Calvinism and religion. Next slide, please. As you can see from the political cartoon there, Kuiper's nation, notion of the antithesis was not always that popular. In his lecture on religion, the antithesis runs between the modernist view of religion on the one hand and the Calvinist view of religion on the other. Abram Kuyper said, modernism has an evolutionary view of religion, proceeding from animism to polytheism to monotheism. It's a man-centered religion that serves the needs of the feeble, but can be discarded by those who have been enlightened and delivered by science. 
Calvinism, on the other hand, runs diametrically counter to the modernist view of religion. God does not exist for the sake of man, but all creation exists to serve God, and he is the one who has planted the seed of religion in our hearts. Here, said Kuiper, Calvinism is the highest form of Christianity because unlike the others, Calvinism doesn't have priests. It doesn't allow any human intermediary between God and man except for Christ alone. And Calvinism recognizes that religion does not simply fill a human need, nor does religion simply extend as far as the reach of a human intermediary or priest, but it has a comprehensive scope. It exercises its influence over all areas of life. Now the question, of course, then, is how is religion able to be so comprehensive that its influence extends far beyond the walls of the church? Now it's here that Kuiper brings in the doctrine of common grace, as you'll see in a quote on the next slide. Kuiper said this, For not only did God create all men, not only is he for all men, but his grace also extends itself not only as a special grace to the elect, but also as a common grace to all mankind. To be sure, there is a concentration of religious life and light in the church, but then in the walls of this church there are wide open windows, and through these spacious windows the light of the eternal has to radiate over the whole world. In 1937, which was the centennial of Abraham Kuyper's birth, Klaas Hilder wrote a sympathetic critique, you could say, of Kuyper's lectures. Schilder had great admiration for Kuyper's grand vision for Calvinism, but on the point of common grace, he disagreed. Normally, said Schilder, common grace is mentioned in the context of sin and guilt. The explanation goes like this, although the world is under judgment and curse, God tempers the judgment and he restrains the curse and that's common grace. But in his lecture on religion, Kuiper spoke of common grace in a much more positive sense, not simply to restrain the curse, but to penetrate and permeate religion so that it grows and expands and radiates over the whole world. And that for Schilder was much too positive. When Kuiper wrote that there would have been next to no cultural development without common grace, Schilder responded in disagreement. He said, no, the development of the world was already part of God's counsel from eternity. And furthermore, the antithesis had to be taken into account. So what Kuiper called common, common grace was for Schilder simply a continuation of the cultural mandate in a fallen world. And he said there's not only grace there, but there's also judgment. And so Schilder preferred to speak of a common mandate. In addition to Schilder's criticism, I'd like to add a criticism of my own as well. It strikes me, reading Kuiper's lecture on religion about the role of the church in the world, that Kuiper says very little about the preaching of the gospel, and he says nothing at all about mission. Now, considering his emphasis on the antithesis, I think this is a very striking omission. Schilder, by contrast, stated that the first task of the church will always be the proclamation of that centuries-old antithesis. And that's a quote from his talk, Your Ecumenical Task. You see, Schilder, living somewhat later, had not witnessed the flowering of Calvinism that Abraham Kuyper had promised. Instead, in Schilder's day, the church was being threatened by the false ecumenism of the World Council of Churches, which ignored the antithesis and compromised the historic confessions of the church.
Schilder's colleague, uh, Old Testament colleague Benna Halberda, also emphasized the antithesis in the preaching of the gospel. In the aftermath of two world wars, Halberda too was much more sober than Kuiper about what the church would achieve in society. And in the rise of communism and the rise of the ecumenical movement, Halberda saw the intensification of the antithesis and even the rise of the beast and the false prophet in the last days. So if I may summarize it like this very briefly, the theological tendency of the Freigemak churches in Holland and hence of the Canadian Reformed here was to keep Kuiper's language of antithesis but to avoid his language of common grace. We come to the uh, second part of my presentation. Is the antithesis a theme that can be traced through the Bible and if so, how? And the classic passage uh, for the antithesis is Genesis 3 verse 15 where the Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall strike your head and you shall strike his heel. I need to begin with some exegetical comments on this verse, albeit they impossibly brief. First, this verse is found at the juncture of creation, fall, and redemption. Creation, in this sense, that it is not undone, but providence and the image of God and the cultural mandate all continue. Fall, in this sense, that creation is under a curse, humanity is in bondage to sin and death, and the cultural task will be characterized by toil and pain and vanity. And redemption, in this very limited sense, that the woman is placed not under but over against the serpent who deceived her and that she hears the enigmatic promise that her seed will engage the serpent in a fight to the death. Second, in this verse, and this is important, the Lord asserts his rights as sovereign judge and he establishes enmity by speaking. It is God's word that produces the antithesis. Third, the Hebrew word for enmity, the word eva, connected with the Hebrew word for enemy, does not mean antithesis in the abstract sense of an opposition of ideas that are at odds with each other, but in the much more concrete sense of a hostility between parties that are at war with each other. Fourth, when the Lord says, I will put enmity, then the Hebrew verb there is not in the perfect aspect, which could be interpreted in a performative sense, I hereby put enmity. But rather it is in the imperfect sense, which often has a durative or an iterative sense, I am putting, I will continue to put enmity. And we should therefore regard the antithesis not as a static category, a fixed characteristic of the fallen world, but much rather as a dynamic progressive theme in the history of Revelation. Fifth, the Lord addresses the serpent in snakeomorphic language. I, I looked up that word in a dictionary and I couldn't find it. In any case, Snaky talk. A, a serpent crawling in the dust can kill a man by striking his heel and a man can kill a snake by striking its head. And indeed we have to reckon with the fact that the serpent is called a beast of the field, that is, an animal over which our first parents had received dominion. It's only later in the history of Revelation that we hear of Satan, the accuser, and much later still, that Satan is called the ancient serpent. That's not till the book of Revelation. Now, to be sure, the serpent's ability to speak and to deceive are hints of a more nefarious power at work. And by extension, says Ephesians 2, verse 2, 
The same power is at work in the sons of disobedience. That is, if I may say, the seed of the serpent. Sixth, while Eve is called the mother of all living, her seed is more particular than humanity in general and refers in the first place to Israel. This is clear from the literary structure of Genesis, which takes us from the Toledoth of Adam to the Toledoth of Jacob. It's Jacob's baby photo album, you could almost say, the book of Genesis. This is also hinted at in Genesis 3 verse 15 itself, where the Hebrew word for heel, a cave, is a word play on the name of Jacob, Yaakov, who grasped his brother's heel in his mother's womb. With these comments in tow, we conclude, first of all, that the antithesis in the Old Testament at least may be found where the Lord, by his word, identifies an enemy that threatens the very life of his people, and second, that the Lord who draws the battle lines also promises the victory. How then can we trace the theme of the antithesis through the Bible? I would like to take a redemptive historical approach, but I can only be very selective. In the pre-patriarchal period, we may think of Cain. God warned him that the real enemy was not Abel, but the sinful desires of his own murderous heart. But he refused to listen, and he killed his brother. Yet the Lord granted Adam and Eve another seed, it says, in place of Abel, so that the line of promise might continue. Later in the patriarchal period, the theme of the antithesis is over interwoven with that of the covenant. You see that on the next slide here, Genesis 22, where after Abraham obeyed God's command to offer up his son on Mount Moriah, the Lord said, your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your seed shall the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. As reward for Abram's faith, the Lord gives two promises in tandem. The promise that his seed will defeat his enemies from Genesis 3 verse 15, and the promise that his seed will bless the nations from Genesis 12 verse 3. We also find this twinning of antithesis and covenant in Genesis 25, when Rebekah's infant children struggle together in her womb. The Lord told her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. And when Jacob secured not only the birthright, but the blessing as well, he had to flee for his life because Esau sought to kill him. And upon his return, he also feared for the life of his family. Jacob then had to learn not to resort to deception, but to trust in the Lord. Now we know from that episode that the two brothers went their separate ways and the Lord granted Esau his own place outside the promised land. And yet that ancient enmity flared up throughout Israel's history. In times of strength, Israel annexed Edom. But in times of weakness, the Edomites were a thorn in Israel's side, siding often with Israel's enemies and taking perverse pleasure in the conquest of Jerusalem, provoking the Lord to take vengeance on them. Think of Psalm 137. In the New Testament, the hostility continues even to the trial of Jesus Christ. As you'll see on the next slide, I have an old Dutch sermon from Reverend Van Doren about Christ on trial before Herod. And the sermon has a grand redemptive historical theme and points, Jesus Christ, the great Israel, silent before Herod, the son of Esau. And we will see that this silence is first, full of promise for faith, and second, full of threat for unbelief. The antithesis was also found outside the covenant circle. The book of Exodus, as we'll see in the next slide, uh, Exodus begins with Pharaoh's decree to set the Israelites to hard labor and to kill all their baby boys, which would surely doom the seed of the woman. But the Lord ensured that baby Moses survived, and when the Israelites groaned under their burdens, he sent Moses to them with shepherd's staff in hand to do battle with Pharaoh. 
And Egyptologists have told us that the shepherd's staff is significant because the pharaoh of Egypt would have a shepherd's crook that signified his ability to um, govern the powers of the universe and to create stability. The Lord sent Moses back to the elders of Israel to do battle with Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt, declaring, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may serve, you, may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. The Lord draws the battle lines. And the battle intensified then through ten plagues, and it culminated at the Red Sea, which was a death trap that turned into a way of escape for Israel and a watery grave for her enemies. And the people then did not even have, have to fight, but only to stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. The next mortal enemy was Amalek, the first to attack Israel after the exodus from Egypt. This time, Israel did fight, while Moses lifted his staff in supplication to heaven. And the Lord then declared perpetual war against Amalek, so that a few centuries later, Samuel could say to Saul, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. As you recall, Saul indeed defeated them, but choosing expedience over obedience, he spared their king, Agag, and allowed the people to take the best of the animals. And it was a sin that cost him the kingdom. So high were the stakes in that war. And very striking are the words of Samuel before he hacked Agag to pieces. As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. Now, whether Haman the Agagite was a descendant of this Agag is actually a debated point, but Haman too sought to annihilate God's people, and in his time he did it by way of Persian decree. But a Jewish queen came into the royal court for such a time as this. Haman's devilish plan was overturned, and the Jews were permitted to defend themselves and to kill their enemies. Here, too, is an iteration of the antithesis. Besides the Amalekites, the Lord also placed the ban of destruction on the seven Canaanite nations that the Israelites were to dispossess. As we read in Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 and 2, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Now this passage and others like it have become something of a flashpoint for theologians and apologists in recent years. How can a good God command his people to commit genocide and not only to commit genocide but also to dispossess the first nations of Canaan? But seeing the passage in light of the antithesis helps us to make sense of it. For Israel to live alongside the Canaanites would be fatal for their faith and their survival as a nation. It was a matter of destroy or be destroyed. For the Lord added, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. And notice again how the Lord asserts and declares his sovereignty both in salvation and in judgment. It is he who draws the battle lines, 
and he who decides the outcome. And note again that antithesis is interwoven with covenant. If the people trusted in the Lord, he would deliver them from the hand of their enemies. But if they proved faithless, he would deliver them into the hand of their enemies. Now, it is this perennial battle against syncretism that punctuates the entire history of Israel's life in the Promised Land. Yes, there were times when the land had rest from war, after Joshua finished his conquests, after various judges defeated the enemy of their day, after David defeated all Israel's enemies and left Solomon a kingdom of peace. But these times were short-lived and they showed that the victory of Genesis 3.15 was not yet won. Israel's repeated unfaithfulness invited invasions from additional nations as well, such as the Philistines, the Ammonites, and the Arameans, who interrupted the covenantal way of life. Think of Solomon's marriage alliances, which enabled a syncretism that endangered the very temple service that he had inaugurated. The Bible's refrain for the kings of Judah is that they failed to remove the high places. And the Bible's refrain for the kings of Israel is that they continued in the sin of Jeroboam at the high places of Bethel and Dan. And more heinous still was the sin of Ahab and Jezebel, who made Baal worship the official religion of Samaria and who persecuted the faithful prophets of the Lord, culminating in the dramatic contest on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And although Baal was discredited and Ahab's dynasty was wiped out, the subsequent kings of Israel did not listen to the warnings of the prophets. And so the northern kingdom, which bore the name Israel, was taken into exile, never to return. And Judah was soon to follow. Surely the faithful remnant must have wondered how Israel could ever survive. And yet in a historical context in which Judah had become tiny and was merely a pawn between the superpowers of Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, we have the prophetic literature of the Old Testament where the perspective is nothing short of astonishing. First of all, in the prophets, Israel's God remains sovereign. It is he who speaks with authority, he who draws the battle lines, he who governs the destiny of his people and uses the world powers as pawns in his plan. He who holds the nations accountable to for oppressing his precious people. Secondly, in the prophets, in his covenant love, the Lord foretells the return of his people from exile, the coming of an era when it will again be Israel's task to be a light to the nations. And thirdly, the Lord reveals that the return from exile will usher in a restoration that will far exceed the best times of Israel's history, a restoration of paradise itself. And here I think of Isaiah uh, 65, some verses there. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And besides the prophets, we also have the book of Daniel, who not only lived to see the exile come to an end, but who also received visions of future kings that were used by hostile spiritual forces to make war on God's people, so much so that Jerusalem would even be destroyed again. And yet Daniel learned the archangel Michael and his forces would fight back, and ultimately the righteous would rise from the dust and shine like the sun. Now for the fulfillment of all of this, we come to the New Testament, 
And it is here, of course, that the centuries-old enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent comes to a climax in the life and death of Israel's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Born under the Pax Romana of Caesar Augustus, his mission was nevertheless not to rescue Israel from Rome, but rather sinners from Satan. Many passages could be mentioned, but I'd like to restrict my focus to the authority of Christ's words. It was by quoting scripture that Christ resisted the temptations of the devil. And his preaching was a matter of announcing that the kingdom of God was at hand, of calling the people to repent and believe, and pronouncing woes on the towns that refused. With authority, he commanded the evil spirits to come out, and they obeyed. He shared that ministry with his disciples as well, sending them out to the towns of Israel as lambs in the midst of wolves to preach and to heal and to shake the dust from their feet if people refused to receive them. And when the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name, then Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Lord Jesus spoke with authority and he won the people's admiration. But he called for more than admiration, radical faith and costly discipleship. His preaching ministry cut to the heart, exposing the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders and the double-mindedness of would-be disciples. His words drew battle lines, and the battle centered on himself. Who do people say that I am? And nothing less than Peter's conf confession would do, but few came to that confession. The people were divided about him, and Christ predicted that the division would only sharpen, as we see in the next slide. He said in Matthew 10, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter is more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Christ's preaching ministry drove him inexorably to the cross. The zoom lens of the Gospels focus our attention on his last days when Satan entered Judas's heart and he betrayed Jesus to the chief priests and his disciples forsook him and the Sanhedrin condemned him. And Herod and Pilate became friends over him. The Roman governor condemned him. Gentile soldiers mocked and crucified him. The women were helpless to support him, and God himself forsook him. But Christ remained obedient to death, and by his self-sacrificial love, he paid the penalty for sin and broke the power of death. And therefore, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It is impossible to overstate the significance of Christ's resurrection from the dead. First, the resurrection authorizes Christ to sit on the throne of David at God's right hand from where he pours out his spirit and wields all authority in heaven and on earth. Second, it makes the gospel the authoritative proclamation of the victory of Jesus Christ and it propels the apostolic commission to make disciples of all nations. Third, it strips Satan of his access to heaven as accuser of the brethren and it gives the saints access to God through the mediation of Jesus Christ and the interposition of the Holy Spirit. Fourth, 
Fourth, it lays upon all believers the obligation to resist the devil, to put to death all that belongs to the sinful nature, and to live more and more out of the new life that they have in Christ, submitting to his kingship in all areas of their lives. And fifth, it gives the church great assurance of the return of Jesus Christ, the final judgment, the complete defeat of Satan, and the gift of eternal life. All of this gives great reason for hope, and yet it is a hope that remains sober. Benna Hallwarda put it this way, the triumph of Christ's ascension is indeed a step forward. The accuser is thrown out of heaven. But this also makes the life of the church more difficult. The devil has great wrath, knowing that his time is short. In Revelation, we read that the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And so that ancient enmity of Genesis 3.15 will continue until Christ returns. And yet the certainty of victory remains, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the saints in Rome, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So to conclude the second part of my presentation, yes, the antithesis is indeed a theme that runs through the scriptures. It can be identified where God's word draws battle lines between his people and the mortal enemies that threaten their very existence. And it can be traced in a redemptive historical manner through the Old Testament to its fulfillment in Christ's death and resurrection and its final outcome on the last day. As such, it is a significant theme for the preaching of the gospel. And that brings me briefly to our third question, what place should the antithesis have in the preaching of the gospel? Here I would like to offer five reflections. First, as our redemptive historical study has confirmed, the antithesis is not merely an opposition of irreconcilable ideas, but it is a hostility between parties at war. It's not a static category, a fixed characteristic of the fallen world, but it's a dynamic and progressive theme in the history of Revelation. This means that it is not yet the sign of a good preacher that he regularly sprinkles the word antithesis in his preaching, but rather that the preacher wrestles with his scripture passage in its redemptive historical context and does justice to both the continuities and the discontinuities of this theme. And Halberda gives us an example from the Old Testament command to destroy the Canaanites. How do you preach on something like that? Well, Halberda writes this, the New Testament church has no longer been assigned a particular land in which to live a separate life until Christ has come. Her task, rather, is that of missionary expansion. And the command is to preach to all peoples. God has not commanded the extermination of a single people. Yet in this command there is an instruction also for the New Testament church to keep itself unstained from the world and so to keep the witness of Jesus Christ pure. Also, there is an instruction never to adopt heathen cultural practices in a more or less Christianized form. In that regard, God still regards, God still desires rather the radical removal of all synthesis. Now I find it striking that Halberda mentions here the missional task of the church. And that brings me to my second reflection. I mentioned earlier that Abraham Kuyper in his lecture on religion said very little about the preaching of the gospel and nothing at all about mission. And given his emphasis on the antithesis, I said that this was a striking omission and that Schilder, on the other hand, said that the first task of the church will always be the proclamation of that centuries old antithesis. Here, I would like to clarify that we should not seek a choice between being either more antithetical or more missional in our preaching. Rather, missional preaching 
is antithetical because the gospel draws battle lines. It holds out Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation and of escape from death. It asserts the rights of his kingship and it demands that people repent and believe. Such preaching will not leave people untouched, but will have a twofold outcome, obedient faith or obstinate unbelief. As in Genesis 3.15, so still today, it is the word of God that draws the battle lines. Thirdly, I am not arguing that antithetical preaching should be a Canadian reform distinctive, but rather, with Klaas Schilder, that it is the ecumenical task of the church. Now, of course, when Schilder addressed the question, what is your ecumenical task, he was speaking to young women who would not become preachers of the gospel. And to them, Schilder said, your first ecumenical task is witnessing. If witnessing, he said, remains the quiet, level-headed passing on of the content of Scripture as we confess it, then it represents the beginning of all Christian efforts in the ecumenical sphere. Fourth, the theme of the antithesis has lessons for the preacher's character. The need for antithetical preaching does not yet imply that the tone of the preaching should be antagonistic or hostile or dismissive. Here preachers need to remember that the battle of Genesis 3.15 was won by Christ's self-sacrificial love and that they need to reflect and to model that love. Here I think also of the generous spirit that Jesus modeled for his disciple John, as we'll see on the next slide. When John said, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. And finally, I venture a little bit hesitantly into the area of Christian education. After all, if the preaching of the church should be antithetical, then surely the instruction in the home and the school should be as well. And indeed, one of the four hallmarks of our Christian schools is that they are antithetical. Should they also be missional? Now, to be sure, it is not the task of our schools to train missionaries, nor is it their goal to send students into the world two by two. But if, as we've seen, the biblical theme of the antithesis leads to the Great Commission, then our school teachers should also reflect on the missional implications of the antithesis, if only to ensure that our students are not taught to withdraw from the world, but are equipped to engage it with the message of the suffering.